Welcome to this episode of Chatting with Stacks. I'm your host, Bill Stacks, and today I got Larry Roll that, that actually worked. So we made a deal with the Bahamian government, and the Bahamian government made a deal with uh, that they would take a certain percentage of what, whatever income and everything, and they worked it out, and they wind up building him a beautiful, beautiful hospital, which is still there in, uh, in Freeport, Bahamas. And uh, uh, he was, he was, he moved out, he moved to the Bahamas, set up the clinic and all this, all the up-to-date material the Bahamian government bought for him. And it was, it, it was great. And, and basically that was it. He didn't need any more help from us. And right at that time, I get a phone call. I was in Florida racing horses and I get a phone call from uh, my cousin's husband my cousin Cookie and uh, husband Tony called me up and he says, listen, Larry says, I have bad news. He says, your cousin uh, was given three months to live. She has terminal cancer. And and, and I said, are you sure? And and he says, yeah, now this is a kid I grew up with. So I says, do me a favor, Tony. I says, send it to two or three, uh, get, get a couple of, get another opinion because how did this just happen? He says, Larry, it just happened. She wasn't feeling well. I took her to the doctor and they says she has three months to, I think they said three months to live unless they take out a stomach or something like that. And that would give her another few months or something. I says, listen, I says, just, just get a second opinion and call me right back. So he, he called me back a few days later, and he says the second opinion was uh, the same. So I called up Dr. Burton in the Bahamas, and I told him, and he says, send her right down here. Well, it was true. She had terminal cancer, and it was at the last stages, and she was losing a lot of weight and, and very sick. And uh, so um, I can, uh, without going through everything, I can only tell you that eight weeks later, she was cancer-free. And uh, and then we started from there. Wow. Now, what happened? What happened was uh, because of because of that, and naturally everybody knew, and and all the cousins knew, and I have a very big family. All her friends knew. Now, when she came back to the state, she had to go to the Bahamas, and she had to stay there for eight weeks. When she came back, and she was cancer free because she went right back to the doctors here to make sure and everything, and uh, they gave her a clean bill 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 of health. Now, uh, back then uh, they didn't have cell phones; they had nothing. We used to have these big answering machines, and because of my business, I had a big answering machine with two two tapes, two cassette tapes in them, and I would come home at night and listen to the my messages. Um, and, and within, within a month, I must've got two or 300 messages that we heard about cookie. My, my three-year-old son has leukemia. My, my daughter has cancer. My da- and, and so I start sending these people down there. Now at the time, uh, he wouldn't take any insurance. There was no insurance that would cover it because back then, if you remember, you might be too young to remember back then, but in, in the in the seventies and eighties, um, alternative therapy and alternative medicine was considered quackery, and it was probably ten percent of whatever was, was administered as far as healthcare goes in the United States. So whenever you went to a doctor and stay in the in the perfect example of Steve McQueen. Steve McQueen got a hold of me when he found out about this. And he, he says, Larry, can you get me down there? He says, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I got uh, I got uh, three, four uh, other doctors that said I have it and I have months to live. So I brought him down to Dr. Burton and uh, I, I hand delivered him down there uh, because Steve McQueen, you know, I, I never yeah. had- I was Wait, a, what year I, was that? Do you remember the year? Was, yeah, it was probably probably in the in the early early eighties, I think. Whenever Steve McQueen, whatever, whenever he died, it was I think a year before that. Now the reason he died was because when I brought him down there, and. Uh, Dr. Burton said, uh, he took his blood and he says, yes, you, you, the American doctors were correct. You, you know, you don't have long to live. And uh, he says, uh, I will treat you, but 
he says, you, you need to know, I've been trying to get back to the United States and save Americans for the last 10 years. Congressional hearings didn't help. Nothing helped. They just won't let me back in. The American Cancer Institute, they have the very, very strong, powerful, uh, the people that own all the cancer treatment places are all privately owned. They're making million, billions of dollars. And uh, I can't get back in there. Now, if I treat you and cure you, uh, that would probably help me, but it may not. He says, so what, what you should do is go back to the States, which I went with him, and go back to one of your doctors and just get a note from them saying that you are terminal. There is nothing, no treatment we have and nothing we can do to help you. And come back here with that letter. This way, if anything should ever happen, he says, because you're near death. If you should die before this tre my treatment takes effect, it's going to make my, my plight to get back to the States impossible because you're too ho high. Yeah, it'll make him look really bad, like yeah. you killed him. So he says, but right. if you get me that letter, he says, I'll do it. So he, Steve went back to three of his doctors, and all three refused to give him a letter. They says, yeah, you're going into this quackery stuff. I don't have nothing to do. And they wouldn't give him the letter. And uh, I even tried. I says, Doc, please, you know, he's, you know, and he says, I, I'm sorry, I can't, I won't do it. He says, uh, there's millions of people that are in the same position as him in the United States that are going to die because they won't let me in there. He says, and, 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 and you should know, because I got him on, I think I got him on, on uh, two or three television shows. I got 60 minutes to go down there. I got the congressional hearing with Guy Malinari, and they still wouldn't let him in. The government, during the hearing, during the congressional hearing, the government promised, promised to go down uh, within a week and bring a, a bunch of scientists and doctors and everything. Yeah. They never went. They never went. I called. They said, we'll get it. We'll get that. They never went. They never went. So Steve McQueen wind up going to Mexico, drinking the afterbirth of a cow because they said they had that would help him, and he wind up dying. So that whatever year Steve McQueen died, that's that was the the year before. That's when when all, all of this happened. I can't remember these years. They were 40, 50 years ago. I just I just that's why I try not to mention dates and times, and that's why I give such a span because it started with me in the in the early middle 60s and ended in the middle 80s or late late 80s um so it's it's tough to re, tough to, re, to tough to remember so anyway um that that's what happened and uh and during this time because he didn't take insurance um i was fixing races like the whole world knows now and they know from your podcast and my podcast and I, and I was taking uh, a lot of this money to send people down there I was sending 10 12 15 kids down there with their parents a week now back then it cost uh, the whole trip for each person cost ten thousand dollars including the airfare the the the, the hotel stay food, and the treatment from Dr. Burton. And normally it's a six-week treatment unless it's really, really bad like my cousin, and it turned to be an eight-week treatment. And um, and uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the Dr. Burton story. Now, I was paying, I was, all of these people I was paying for, and then we had a, I had a, I had a basically, black uh, blackmail I, I was paying off uh, the people at the uh, at the airport because the, w w what we were doing were giving these people booster shots that they should take for the first two or three weeks when they're home just to make sure and uh, giving them in frozen vials packed in, in dry ice and uh, so it was a whole network that I that I created. And then years later, the in fact, right now, today, I think the insurance company, I know the insurance company pays for treatments that are down there. And uh, uh, but back then, 
uh, I must have sent, oh, well over 100 people down there. You know, it's a tough thing when you get home and you find your answering machine full of messages. And each message is, is a, you know, like my three-year-old son has leukemia. They give him months to live. My daughter has leukemia. My daughter has cancer. My daughter has this. My daughter, all little kids and everything else, as well as uh, adults. But you know, you know, every week I was going for a hundred thousand, a hundred fifty thousand a week. Plus, I had my Shylock payment that I had to pay of fifteen thousand a week, and uh, and 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 people wanted to, why'd you why'd you fix races? You know, it wasn't only to save my life; it was. And this is a this is a part. I'm glad we're talking about this because this is a part of my life where I spent millions of dollars helping people that I, I don't even talk about. I don't even mention it because in my movie, well, it's going to be a TV series now. Uh, we don't even mention that. We don't, yeah, maybe we'll bring it in because it's going to be a TV series. Now we're going to lead a need, need, a, you know, if it goes for four five, six years, we, we might need some more material just to get out of the mob mob stuff and, and the race fixing stuff and maybe bring some humanitarian stuff into the picture, which this yeah. is, you know, I, I, I saved hundreds of lives and cost me millions of dollars. And I got this money by fixing races. So it wasn't only, uh, and, and I didn't fix the races for any personal gain. I fixed the races originally to save my life from this madman Kabert, the Shylock that, um, I owed the money to, and uh, and then it started. I got involved with uh, the the cancer kids, and uh, how do, how do you say no? And there were many many weeks where, you know, it was a question. And Kabert, and I, and I won't get into that, but Kabert was was a killer. And if I ever miss one week, <laughs> I I had to come up with with fi almost fifteen thousand a week uh, in vig payments. Um, you know, I owed a to almost eight hundred thousand, and he gave me that that eight hundred thousand that that I lost with him as a Shylock loan for two points. So I had to come up with seventy five hundred a week. You know, in in uh, I mean fifteen thousand a week, close to fifteen thousand a week in round numbers, and uh, and sometimes if you only have made twenty thousand a week fixing races. And you got 10 kids that need to go down there and that you promise because I could never hang up the phone and tell a mother, I, I, I if you don't have the money, I can't, I can't take you down there. I, I could never say that. And so I, whoever I answered and I try to call, I call back the ones that had young kids, children uh, that were dying. And uh, you know, if you have 10 kids, 20, 15 kids a, a week, and, uh, you know, it comes to $100,000, $150,000, and all you have is enough money to pay the madman that I had to pay. What what, what do you do, you know? <laughs> so uh, Dr. Burton worked with me a lot. I got the people down there, and as far as his fee went, and, uh, you know, we we wind up making it making it happen. And then once the, uh, once the, the, the whole system, the whole world, started to change from uh, consider considering alternative therapies quackery, when that started to change uh, from 10% of treatment to 50 and 60 and set today, I think alternative treatments might be up to 70, 80% of all treatments. Probably. Uh, in reality, if you think about it, that uh, a couple of things that that, that for the last 200 years, the only treatment for cancer was chemotherapy, radiation, and operation. That's it. And it's been a failure ever since. One out of three people have cancer, and and and, and that's it. it. It never changed. The same thing with heart disease. Uh, 500,000 people a year get heart disease, and 500,000 people a year get, get cancer. So, uh, but they, these treatments for heart disease and the treatments for cancer, everybody knows just just don't work. And only now, only today, and I got out of trying to play God a long time ago, but only today I, I, I understand that they're trying to, instead of all of these invasive things 
like chemotherapy and radiation that rip your body apart and completely depress your immune system. Only today, uh, they're starting to uh, come up with therapies that would build up your immune system and let your own body fight the cancer. So, um, and I, I, don't, I really don't know that much about the treatment today, but I do know that uh, they're still dying from it. And, uh, and the sad part that got me, that got me every year, every year, a few months before the cancer drive, and every year they have a cancer drive. And every year, along with the cancer drive comes, we found a new treatment. We found Laetril, but we're enduring our tests. That it's curing everybody and everything else. And we just need more money. And, and, and that's what they do for the cancer drive every year. They come up with a different treatment that they say is promising and everything else. And it never works. And I'm not going to get into that, but the year that they had the Laetril, or I think it was Laetril, I forgot the names. Um, they, 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 they asked for volunteers. <laughs> <laughs>